Hi and welcome back to the seventh lecture in this lecture series on CCNA3 scaling networks. Uh, the topic for this chapter is EIGPR tuning uh, with me, Joachim Schauderstad from the University of Skövde. So to look a little bit more concise about what we're going to go through in this lecture, we're going to talk about tuning of the I, uh, EIGPR and more specifically we're going to talk about route summarization Propagating default routes, we're going to check how we can modify hello and uh, hello and hold timers, and we're going to look at load balancing. Uh, and then we're going to move on to troubleshooting, and more specifically, we're going to look at how you can discover some common errors and how you can fix them. So let's get right through it with EIGPR Auto Summary. And as we touched in the previous chapter, uh, auto summary can be used by routers to enable the router to group several subnets into one routing update. And the default behavior of uh, at least older routers is to do this automatically. I, I think that the newer ones with iOS 15 and forward will not do it. But the idea is at least that when you have we have a router which is responsible for subnets, which you know, for different subnets that are all within the same classful boundary, then the router will summarize that into one routing update. So if we look at a picture here, we can see that router one is responsible for the subnets 172, 16, 1, 2, and 3. And those are all, all slash 24 networks, but without a summary, router one would advertise this as one network. So instead of saying, hey, I have those three networks, it's going to say, hey, I have network 175.16.00-16. So um, you can also do this manually if you like. So if you turn off out a summary, you can still calculate it manually. So for instance, if your router that's responsible for the networks 192, 1.0 and 1.228 with a slash 20, uh, 25 mask, you can advertise this as one network using the network command and then you would do 192.168.1.0-24. And why would you want to do this? Well, the most obvious uh, reason is that it will limit the amount of needed routing updates. So if we are in like in the previous example here, if router one is responsible for three networks, not using out a summary would require us to advertise each and one, each and every one of those networks individually. But with uh, summarization, we can just advertise one network. Also, uh, out of summary or route summarization will limit the size of routing tables because the other routes or the other routers would only have to have one routing entry that would cover all those networks. However, there is a big drawback and that is that we can generate routing issues in discontinuous networks. And with discontinuous networks, we mean routes uh, when we have uh, networks uh, that are belonging to the same classful boundary that are split up over different routers. So looking at in the picture uh, picture sample here, we see there is one uh, 172.16 network attached to router one, and there is another one attached to router two. And this is an example of a discontinuous network. So in this example, what's going to happen is that when we have out a summary, router one will advertise that it has 172.16.00 slash 16 um, attached to it and it's going to broadcast that route to router 3 saying that any of those networks or this big network can be reached through reached through me however as we see one of those networks 172.16.2 up here is actually atta attached to router 2 so when router 1 advertises that network as a network that is connect di directly connected to router 1 that's going to cause router inconsistencies. Because the thing here is that router two will, will advertise the same thing. Uh, and router three in this case will think that both, both router two and router one are, pro, uh, are good ways to any of those 172.16 networks. Uh, and the solution to not having this issue is of course just to disable out a summary using the no out of summary command in, uh, in the router EIGPR configuration mode. So that's it for auto summary. You should be aware of this problem. And if you did not disable auto summary using the no auto summary command, then you can have routing inconsistencies when you have these types of discontinuous networks. So the next uh, thing we're going to look at is how we pro can propagate a default route. 
And a default route is usually something that we want to have somewhere in our network, for instance, for routes to the internet. Uh, we're using a default route, you know, uh, from the last course that that's sort of a catch-all. So you're saying that, well, if, if we don't have any route for this package, just send it out this way. And the common way for a business or for an organization is to maybe have one way or two ways to the internet, and then you don't want to use, uh, and then you can't use uh, dynamic routing outside of your AS. So instead, you say you do a static default route, saying that every traffic that you leave our network, uh, i.e., go to a network that is not in our domain, you just send it out this interface. So the syntax for this in IPv4 would be IP. Uh, IP route 0000000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, and then an exit interface. And so uh, what we need then is to use IGPR to distribute the default route within the network because if we have one router that's configured with a static default route and that will be the router connected to the internet then we need that router to tell all other routers in the AS about that default route. And the way we do that is that we use the command redistribute static within uh, within the EIGPR uh, configuration mode. And what's going to happen then is that uh, the routing table will look as in the picture here. And you'll have a entry that is D star EX. And what that means is that it's a dynamically learned route using EIGPR. That's the D. And then the EX will tell that it's an external route. So it's not a route learned originally from EIGPR. It's a route learned in some other way that's been redistributed. And you can also see that the administrative distance for such a route is 170 as compared to the normal EIGPR uh, administrative distance, which is 90. So that's it. Here's something that you have to know about. We're going to do it in practice in a little while, but before that, we're going to look a little bit on bandwidth and timers. Uh, so as default, EIGPR is allowed to consume up to 50% of the available bandwidth on a link. Uh, so this is usually not a problem, but in extreme cases, this may need to be modified to make, um, for instance, to make EIGPR operate without consuming too much of the available bandwidth. I mean, on extremely slow speed link uh, links, the bandwidth used by EIGPR could actually be too much and influencing the way that that link can operate. Uh, and you may also, in some cases, want to increase the loud bandwidth so that the EIGPR process can actually take place in a good way. I would personally say that if you're in a situation where you actually have to mix uh, mess with this, then you should you should well, preferably change the link to a better link type, but if that's not possible, maybe you should consider using static routing or something else instead. Uh, however, the command that you use is an interface command that is IP bandwidth percent EIGPR, the AS number and the percent that you want to allow. And then, uh, for the same reason, you can also modify the hello and hold timers to uh, incre uh, either increase the reliability of the link. I mean, if you send uh, the default for hello uh, timers on Ethernet is to send one uh, a hello message every five seconds, but maybe you want to do it every second just to make sure that you only use that link if it's up. Uh, because if the link goes down, you know that the hold timer by default is 15 seconds and there's going to be a 15 second delay in worst case before the link goes down. Maybe you want to want to change the hold time to like three seconds because you really want to close it as, as quick as possible. Or maybe you want to increase the timers to make sure that less uh, traffic is sent over the link. Uh, anyhow, you can modify those timers uh, as in, uh, using the interface commands IP hello interval EI. DRP or EP hold time EIGRP. Uh, and you also have to make note that these timers must match on both sides of the interface in order for an adjacency to form. So if you configure a different low interval on one side, you also have to do it on the other side. So moving on to load balancing, which is actually quite a cool feature. Uh, and by default, as we explored in the previous chapter, EIGPR will load balance uh, over equal cost lengths and it will load balance over a maximum of four total equal cost path. Uh, if you want to, you can configure this uh, value to be um, up to 32 different paths using maximum path and the number you want in, in EIGPR configuration mode. If you select one, then you just disable load balancing, but you can load balance up uh, over up to 32 different paths, which can be nice to know. 
Uh, also, EIGPR can be configured for load balancing over routes with different metrics, and this is quite cool. Uh, to do this, you use the EIGPR command that is called variance, and you do variance and a integer, a whole number, and then uh, load balancing will take place over routes with a metric lower than the best route multiplied by the variance. So if we have three routes to the same destination network with 1,000, 2,000 and 3,000 as the metrics and we set the variance to two, then since the lowest uh, or the best route is of metric 1,000, EIGPR will load balance over routes with um, that times the variance, which is two. So it will load balance over links with 2,000 or less in metric. So it will load balance over two. If we want to load balance, uh, allow it for even more variance, we can set the variance to three, and then in our scenario, it would use all links with a metric of 3000 or less. Uh, you can also use the command, uh, the default behavior when you just modify the variance is that uh, the load balancing will be equal. So equally amount of an equal amount of traffic will be sent out each link. But if you want to uh, do to balance the amount of traffic in relation to the route, route metric, you can use the command traffic share balanced. So that's it for this little theoretical part where we discussed uh, summarization, default route propagation, some timers and the load balancing. Now, if you have any questions, you know what to do with them. But for now, we're going to have a look on propagating default routes in practice. So let's head over to Packet Tracer. Uh, and this is a topology from the Packet Tracer task 7.1.3.4. Uh, and we're just going to do it as, uh, um, as, the, uh, as the task says. And we're going to start working with the IPv4 uh, enabled router here. Uh, so the idea now is that we're just going to begin with having a look at our running config to verify that the I, uh, EIGPR configuration looks okay. Um, and as we can see here, we have router EIGPR1, and we have one network, which is a manually summarized network, because you can see that it's 172.3100, and here we have 171.31.8.9. So this is a manual summarization of those two networks. And what we want to do now is to begin with configuring a default route, uh, and the idea here is that all traffic should go out towards the internet on the serial 010 interface. Uh, so we do a configure terminal, IP route, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, 0, and we say serial, 0, 0, no, uh, 0, 1, 0. Um, so now if we just verify that looking at the rounding table, we can see that we do have a gateway of last resort and it's a static default route as indicated by the S star here. Now we're going to make EIGPR distribute that route. So what we do is that we go into our EIGPR configuration mode with the router EIGPR1 and then the command to use is redistribute and then we have uh, options to redistribute other EGPR routes. We can redistribute OSPF, RIP or whatever we want but for now we're gonna do static. Uh, this means that this route will redistribute any static routes configured on this router. So that's done. And now we're just going to look at one of the branch routers to see that it actually got that route. Uh, so what we do is enable and then we go show IP route. And then we can see down here that we learned a, a EIGPR route that is external. And this is the one that we configured. And just as in the theory, you can see that the administrative distance is 170 as opposed to other EIGPR routes, for instance, this one just above here, which has an administrative distance of 90. Uh, so that's all nice and well. Uh, actually, we don't, we won't go pinging and stuff. We're just going to do the same thing for IPv6. So what we're doing is that we go to the 
IPv6 edge router. And this time we go to configuration terminal and we do IPv6 route. IPv6, IPv6 route. And then to do a static default route, you can simply go colon colon dash dash zero. And it's going to go out an interface, which we are not aware of yet. So let's check it. Again, 010. And there it is done. So then we have to do the same thing again, which is propagated. So we go IPv6 router EI GPR one and redistribute. And again, it's a static route that we want to redistribute. So we go redistribute static. And uh, so again, we can go just take end on this one and we uh, do a show IP v6 route to look at the IPv6 routing table and you can see that we do have our static route here and finally we're going to go have a look at one of the branch routers to see that it did get propagated and so we do configuration terminal to show IPv6 route and there you see that it's learned here and in the case with IPv6 it's just getting called external uh, but you see up here in the notes that EAX went in the terms of uh, IGP, EIGPR is uh, EX only for some reason. So that's actually it for this practical. We're going to go back to the theory and have a few pictures on troubleshooting before we get back to a, uh, another practical on troubleshooting. So uh, in troubleshooting, there is some commands that I really want to emphasize. So the first one is show IP EIGPR neighbors. And what this will do is that it will display information about EIGPR neighbors. Uh, this allows us to verify that the router that we're currently troubleshooting is forming neighbor, neighbor adjacencies with the routers that we expect. Uh, then of course, show IP route, that's sort of the result of all EIGPR stuff, that's the routing table where we can see everything. Uh, we also have show IP protocol, which will display EIGPR settings. Um, it will also display settings for other route routing protocols, but it's sort of a summary of how EIGPR uh, works and is set up on the local router. And finally, show EIGPR topology table that will show the entire topology table with successors and feasible successors and all of that on a router. If we want to do the uh, if you want to do the IPv6 version of a command, you just go show IPv6 instead, instead of show IP. So let's just quickly look at some of the more common errors that you can do. And there is another one that it's sort of given, which is lacking IP connectivity. If there isn't connectivity on the uh, network layer, of course, routing isn't going to work. Um, one that I've seen quite a lot, both in class and in practice, is uh, auto summary of discontinuous networks. That makes for a lot of issues. Uh, also, misconfigured passive interfaces. According to some, the best practice of configuring EIGPR is to just set all uh, interfaces as, uh, as passive, and then you have to uh, rem remember to remove the passive interface uh, statement on the interfaces where you want routing updates to be sent. Uh, and also missing network statements for IPv4 or missing interface configuration for IPv6. So uh, the common way is that you just have to do it all correctly in order for stuff to work. It goes without saying, but in reality, these are the five things that people tend to uh, make mistakes on. So just have this as a sort of a membrance list. But And also whenever you're configuring anything, Make sure that when you expect an adjacency to, to be formed between two routers because of the configuration that you do, ensure that it happens. So if you're configuring your first router, then moving on to the second, then don't just assume that your configuration is correct. Actually verify it using the show commands or pinging or whatever. So if there aren't any questions, we're going to move on to... Uh, the practical for the troubleshooting part and actually since this is a video lecture I will move on even if there are questions because I'm not going to sit here in the recording room waiting for questions because that would be silly. So let's go in Packet Tracer. This is a very nice task because what it says to us is basically that hey here is a topology 
and as you can see if we do some pings it's broken so we're going to fix the EIGPR configuration in this setting uh, and we're going to do it with just looking at stuff. So what I would do is just go into some router and start uh, looking. I mean, one of the first things that you can do when is just to show an, do, do a show IP route and you can see that this router is not getting any EIGPR routes because there are no routes denoted D in the routing table. So what would be a reasonable next step? Well, maybe we can start looking at neighbors. So we do a show IP uh, EIGPR neighbors to see if there are any adjacencies formed, and there isn't. Um, so why don't we just do a show round to see what the hell happened. So if we look at EIGPR here, we can see that we have router EIGPR 11. That's actually fine. I would guess, knowing that uh, I've done a few Cisco labs, I would guess that router process here should be uh, should be one, but whatever. Uh, then we have some passive interfaces, uh, where we have one, which is gigabit ethernet uh, zero, 00, that appears to be good. And then we have uh, some network statements for 172, 31, 10, 40, and 40, and that's also uh, in accordance with the topology table. So in this instance, I would say that the issue here, if you will, would be the uh, AS number or the process number for EIGPR, but let's not care about that. Let's set this one as the master. So we're just going to assume that the process number is going to be 11, and that's what we're going to move on to with the router 2. Uh, so, if we just go to router 2 and we do the same thing, where we go enable and we do a show IP route, we can see that this router also doesn't really work. Uh, it does. Uh, we can see here that it has a static default route configured and that is a sign that we should redistribute that, but there is no, uh, no EIGPR information, so I'm guessing if we do a show IP EIGPR uh, neighbors, there's not going to be any. And here the process number is also 1, so the process number is a mismatch. So let's go into fixing that. Uh, let's do a show, show run. Um, and we can see here that there was, uh, there's also at least one network statement missing, because uh, yeah, we have 40 and 20, but there should be two 40s, right? So let's go into fixing this one. Uh, and how we will do that is that we go to configuration terminal and we just go no uh, router EIG, EIGPR1 because we decided to go with 11 as the number. Uh, next then we just reconfigure this router. We go router EIGPR11 and we do some start by doing some passive interface for our gigabit 101. Uh, we do out, no auto summary because uh, we can see that there are discontinuous networks here. We have 172 networks all over the place. Uh, so next we'll just go ahead and uh, decide what networks to distribute. And in this case, we can start with 172.31.40.224 being the network over here pointing to R1. Uh, and that should cause the router to form an adjacency. And uh, so the wildcard mask in this case will be 0003 and you see that it does form an adjacency, so that is good. Let's also do the network pointing to R3, which is uh, 228. And then finally do the client network, which is network 172.31.20.0.000255. So now this one should be uh, nearly done. We should remember to do the redistribute static as well. And now that's all good. Uh, so let's see finally what can be wrong with router 3. So I'm guessing that if we do uh, a, a show IP EIGPR neighbors, there will be none. No, but and the process number is 1. So let's also go and check. Uh, a show IP protocol just to demonstrate that, pro uh, that. So in this case, uh, it's not very weird that we don't have any um, any what what is it called any adjacencies because this one is now running in EIGPR one, whereas the other ones are in eleven. And uh, but let's see here if we can determine if there are any more issues. We have a passive interface that looks fine. 
we are rounding for some networks that also seems fine so maybe that's the only issue so let's go configuration terminal and again we have to do no uh, no router igpr1 to remove that configuration eigpr1 instead we do router eigpr11 uh, and first we go passive interface gigabit ethernet one and then we do a network and we can start with the one pointing to towards router 2 so that would be 172 uh, 31 40.288 and now there should be an uh, an adjacency oops 228 so there is an adjacency with router 2 so then we do the network pointing to router 1 which is ending on 232 and we have an adjacency there as well and then we also do the client lawn which I see is uh, 172.31.30.0.0.0.255 and now everything should actually be working so the last and final thing that we're going to do is to first look at a routing table for this device uh, so we see that now it actually does get uh, EIGPR routes and we can also see that the default route that we uh, distributed from router 2 is being propagated and that's actually it. So now we did some nice troubleshooting and I'm just going to go through the commands again on router 3. So if we begin with show IP route here that actually uh, shows us that things are working as they should because we do get these EIGPR routes for the networks that we expect. So we have for 10, we have for 20, we have for 40, and we also have our default route. So that's what we configured uh, our network to distribute. Uh, we can also do then show IP EIGPR neighbors. And we see that we have two neighbors. Uh, something that is actually a little bit fun to, to look at here is if we go show uh, EIGPR show IP EIGPR topology is that we can see our topology table and we can see that there is one network with two successors. Uh, something that I actually want to do here because uh, you see that if I do my show IP route, you can see that for this network, uh, the path to 40, there is actually a load balancing in play for us. Uh, or two equal cost path. You can see the metric over here. It's the same for both. So one thing that I want to do is to go into router three and change the bandwidth of uh, change the bandwidth of serial uh, of this of this link so that I change the cost. And I'm going to look you show you this variance command. So what we're going to do is to is that we go into configure terminal. We go into interface serial. Uh, so, and we do uh, IP, uh, no, we just do EI, uh, IP EI, oh, we just do bandwidth, am I stupid? So, and we do bandwidth one. Um, And you can see that there are some changes do, done by the dual algorithm. And if we do a show IP route again, you should notice that there should be a difference in the topology table. So you see now for the network that is 40 here, there is only one route. And that is because we modified the bandwidth here. So the metric of, uh, of this route from R3, R3 to R1 is going to be much higher. So if we do look at the topology table, do show uh, IPER topology. You can see that if we look at this network here, then you can see that the metric for uh, the metric for the path going from router 3 to router 1 has a immensely high metric 
However, you can see that it's still a feasible successor because the reported distance, the distance that router one has to that network is still the same. So we're going to see if we can't go into uh, the EIGPR configuration and use the variance command to set the metric multiplier. So if we just set it to the highest, remember that the default behavior of EIGPR is to load balance across equal cost links. And uh, when we are setting the variance, we are saying that instead load balance across all possible routes that has and the, uh, that has a metric that is lower than the best path times the variance. So I can't really calculate this in my head, but I'm hoping that by saying uh, a variance of 128, it's gonna work. So we do uh, we do variance 128. Uh, we and now we're going to do take it to fast forward time a little bit, and we're going to have a look in the routing table. And uh, that didn't cut it, so I think that we do have to give, get back to the uh, to the interface configuration and uh, modify the bandwidth again. So what we're going to do is uh, to make the, make the met metric for that link between R3 and R1 a little bit lower by modifying the bandwidth once again. So we go interface, serial, zero, 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 and maybe if I go bandwidth 100, links are going to work. So we have a little process going on. The JSONC has to be reformed. And now we can go do show IP route. Still didn't work. Uh, so if we go do show IP IGPR topology, uh, you can see that the metric is obviously still too high. So we go in again and we set the bandwidth to 1000 and please let it work this time. Uh, so then we go do show IP route. Do show IP EIGPR topology. I sort of have to make it work now, won't I? Okay, so that should actually work. Uh, so do show uh, run. Ah, oh, okay. So this is a rather stupid uh, error. I did a variance for the wrong EIGPR instance. Okay, let's take that as uh, another show of uh, troubleshooting. So now we're going to correctly configure the variance in router EIG EIGPR 11, and we do variance. Uh, 20 and now you see that there is some recalculations and we go and do show IP route and now you see again that for the route to the dot 224 network which is here there are two routes installed even if one of them has a higher metric so that was it for the troubleshooting and that actually concludes this lecture on EIGPR tuning and troubleshooting. Uh, let's see you next time where we're going to look at OSPF. Thank you and goodbye.